Boy, what a pal. What nice things he said, huh? Old Heroes uh, was a, I'm glad he used the phrase, because I was, uh, let's see, two or three days ago, someone called me up and said, you know, Studs Turkle is 90. Sure, many of you have read Studs Turkle. So I called up Studs, and I said, um, how are you doing? He said, I'm doing fine. <laughs> so I said, well, I'm going to go be addressing uh, people in the state of Washington. So what, what, what message have you got? Ah, oh, tell them the green is the tree of life. <laughs> I had another old friend one time, uh, Sender Garland. If anyone ever was in the Boulder area of Colorado, any time over the last 20 years, they probably ran into Sender, who was uh, previous to that, been in the Communist Party. And he was an incredible, like many old commies, he was an incredible organizer. I met him doing anti-intervention work in the, would have been the late 80s, when he was in his late 70s, I think. You have, you'll have to, we haven't got Lisa here to do the math, but it's around there. And um, he was the best organizer in Colorado. And he died last year at the age of 97. And I was writing about him in The Nation. And I said, uh, he's probably the nation's oldest subscriber, began subscribing in 1916, and he's probably America's senior radical. Very dumb thing to write. <laughs> the letters began to pour in. How can you say that? He was a comparative youngster. <laughs> Well, there was a famous lady in Washington uh, who was, you know, ended up as in the Audubon Society. What, she died at... Yeah, what, she 99? I think she, she was 100. I thought, that's it. Well, it gradually went climbing up. It was like the lottery. Finally, we figured out that America's senior radicals, so far as we knew, was a professor emeritus at MIT, still kicking, at 106. And uh, his main claim to fame, well, one of his claims to fame is he'd been tried for sedition for seeking to overthrow the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in 1947. <laughs> and boy, does it need to be overthrown. <laughs> I mean, everything needs to be overthrown at some point, but Massachusetts is way, way higher than that. And the other thing you know, when you, when you look at a guy like Sender or you uh, hear of someone like Studs, and Morton was evoking when we got together, in, uh, you know, back in the late 80s, and I just went through Eugene, the, and you meet old pals from the past, the, the tremendous continuity in, in political activism, that you can see people who've gone through struggle after struggle and cause after cause and you, they're still in the game. They're not a hang dog, they're spry. I, for years I used to think, I used to follow, uh, well my dad was an old commie, so that's why I'm coming back to the commies, but um, they always seem to live a real long time. And I was thinking, why is this? And I guess I thought they must, they walked a lot. <laughs> because they were selling the daily worker. <laughs> but they also thought a lot. And Stern, this is not just commies, by the way. I, we will not exclude Trotskyists, not even Maoists, anyone you want. Anyone who's in the change the system game thinks. Thinking is, when they're talking about exercise, they never say thinking is really good. This is, this is much better than jogging, of course. Anything's better than jogging, but... <laughs> I'm for walking myself, but if you walk and if you think, I think, you know, the insurance company should give you a big break. <laughs> and the other thing is, you know, people often say, well, don't, don't, don't you get depressed? And here's a good example. What's happening today? East Timor, independent. Yeah. Yeah. And just think. 
1975, 1976, and supposing someone said to you, this, after the brutal invasion of Indonesia, endorsed, urged on by Kissinger. I was, someone told me, actually I must say a funny remark by Kissinger. Someone described, referred to Bill Clinton as a war criminal, and Kissinger said, Bill Clinton hasn't got the moral fiber to be a war criminal. <laughs> But look at it, 1976, and supposing someone said to you, this will be undone. Indonesia will withdraw. This invasion will not stand. You would have said, oh, I'm, I'm not sure about that. And look what happened, the organi organizing, well, let's start with the heroism, and, you know, and tenacity of the people of East Timor and their, and their leaders. But in this country, you know, it started a movement or the East Timor Action Network. And the things that people do occurred, you know, lobbying, excavating history, looking at what the oil companies wanted in that region of the world, looking at what U.S. overall policy was, writing to the media saying you've got it all wrong again and again, you always get it wrong, you do building coalitions, action days, Journalists like Alan Nairn and Amy Goodman going to East Timor, nearly getting killed. On and on and on. And here we are, you know, 27 years later, and it's Independence Day for East Timor. And if anyone wants to think, is it worth it? Of course it's always worth it, whether you win or lose. But that's a victory. It's an incredible victory. Every time someone threw a dime into the tin for the East Timor National Network, you know, in the end it produced great results. And that is a wonderful thing to think of today. And what other joys do we have today? Well, we have the joys of watching Bush <laughs> saying that, no, he didn't know. <laughs> I think he didn't. I think if they'd gone in maybe and did a show and tell, you know, with a model of the World Trade Center. <laughs> and a model of a plane and brought them into ever-increasing proximity until gradually a glimmer would suffuse his face and he would say, oh, I see what you're talking about. <laughs> he is done. He really is done. Uh, they've made incredible attempts to prove him to be an absolute Machiavelli of political intelligence. He's not. And people say, how do you account for you know, his popularity? I think it is as thin as a thin sheet of ice. Right. As thin as a sheet of ice. People don't forget. I don't think people have forgotten the stolen election. They've got it filed away. They know what happened. The New York Times and the papers can run a thousand reports saying actually it all proves that this and that and the other thing. No. They know it was a stolen election. They know that it just showed how most elections are stolen, starting by making 9% of people of color into felons. You know, put that together with the crack laws, the disproportion in sentencing for powder cocaine and crack cocaine, you have got a very carefully focused, targeted idea to simply not allow people of color to vote. Simple as that. Now, what do people, do they think that Bush is a great president? I think after 9-11, hey, it was a huge moment of national trauma and crisis. You go, you, you support the guy. You know, he's our guy. Sort of. <laughs> you feel you want to rally. You can't all say, you know, the guy who's leading us against this war on terror, you know, is truly dumb. You're not going to say that. And I think a lot of it is, you know, putting up a good front. And it's eroding fast. I think what we'll see now, what's coming up, is there's a trickle. You'll get these memos, you know, the people saying, yeah, well, we sent a message. We sent a message saying people were going to, to, to get in to capture airplanes and fly them at tremendous speed towards major American monuments. Condoleezza Rice then says, it would have required an impossible leap of the imagination <laughs> to put together a speeding plane, a national monument, and come up with the World Trade Center. 
an imaginative foray beyond the powers of those leaders. Maybe you recall that in July of last year, after the, I think, the Egyptian government had alerted the European powers, the big powwow of world leaders, at, uh, I think it was in Genoa, they ringed the place with anti-aircraft guns. This idea that it was an impossible notion that a plane was going to do this. Suicide bombers, they had it all written out. By the way, do I think that they all, you read some stuff saying, you know, they knew exactly what was going to happen, they let it happen. I don't believe that. But what I think it shows is that the enormous sums of money squandered on intelligence, so-called intelligence, 30, 40 billion dollars a year, was worthless against this disaster of September. Because what you need are smart people who can act quickly. They failed. And they should be indicted for that failure. And they will be indicted. <laughs> Let's look at the war on terror. Has, has the war on terror achieved anything? Really? In substantively reducing the risk of terrorist attack. What, and you have to say, well, what prompted those attacks? Was it a generic, obsessive hatred of America, such as the Ashcroft and people say, you know, anything? Or were there real, specific reasons? Well, of course there were reasons. People do things for reasons. What were the reasons? You can go for the list, and actually Osama bin Laden, whether he's now alive or dead, I don't know. A woe betide any tall person in that part of the world, I have to say. <laughs> Wouldn't want to be a tall person in that part of the world. <laughs> what did he say? What did they say? Well, you can start with American troops in Saudi Arabia, viewed as a tremendous offense. Well, there are more and more American troops in Saudi Arabia, so that certainly hasn't been dealt with. Sanctions on Iraq. I often think, you know, what was the, if you, in the minds of those people who flew in those planes on September 11 and killed all those innocent people, if you'd said, if you had a chance to say, you know, all right, give us one statement that made you do this, I would put Madeleine Albright way up there. <laughs> to me, even now, thinking about it, when she was on 60 Minutes, and Leslie Stoll said, you know, they say that 500,000 children have died as a result of the sanctions. That's more than Hiroshima. That's, Leslie Stoll said that. What did Albright say? Now, most people there would have said, oh, I challenge the figures. I believe that 500,000 is a grotesque exaggeration. Maybe 50, maybe 75. Or, you know, not gone along with it. Madeleine Albright didn't do that. She said, we think the price is worth it. An amazing, horrifying statement. And they still think the price is worth it. They're still doing it. And of course, they're now threatening, I don't know whether they'll actually go ahead with it or not, with launching another attack on Iraq. And of course, the major people who will suffer in that will be the civilian population of Iraq. Because that is the way the war is fought. You know, who, they, who ends up on the receiving end? You know, the infrastructure goes, they bomb the city. It turned out they deliberately targeted water treatment plants. You know, in, uh, after the Second World War, at Nuremberg, they hanged uh, General Seyss Inkar, the German High Commissioner of Holland, because he opened the dikes, caused an absolutely catastrophic fall in Dutch agriculture, resulting in a tremendous amount of death. They hanged it. Well, they should hang the people who destroyed the water treatment plants. That is direct... <laughs> well, I'm against the death penalty, but that's a minor... <laughs> You're all worried about that, weren't you? Oh, you thought... <laughs> Chain him to a wall. Chain him to a wall. 
Third, third possibility of the cause of terrorism, America's partiality to Israel in the, against the Palestinians. What a nightmare. Infinitely worse now than it was even in September, and that was terrible. What have we seen? I mean, something to me, again, up there with Albright is Dick Armey, House Majority Leader, one of the most important personages in, in the government, in Congress. I don't know how many of you saw it, up there on the Chris Matthews show, absolutely called for the ethnic cleansing of two million Palestinians out of the West Bank. He said they should leave. Just like that. Go somewhere else. I said, well, what's the army plan? You know, I was finally thinking about it. It could be a play to get all USA to Israel rerouted to Texas because maybe army wants to get the Palestinians located somewhere at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, you know, on the, between the runways, you know, somewhere like that. Then say to Israel, well, we've coped with your Palestinian problem, now we want the $3 billion. That's the level of absurdity and obscenity of what really army was doing. But it's all of a piece. Everybody knows that even under the Oslo plan, what was really the destiny of Palestinians? You know, tiny little enclaves. When I make a joke about Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, it's not so far from the mark when you look at what they were planning for the West Bank. Enormous roads down between the little Palestinian communities, cutting them off from each other. Settlements continuing. Never once did settlements stop. Never once have they stopped under the so-called peace process. And now what do we see? With full-throated support by the United States for Sharon, a war criminal who should be up there with Milosevic. We see the vote in Congress, even against Bush's wishes. And what, what, what did you see there? You saw full-throated endorsement of what Sharon is doing by the US Congress with precisely two senators voting against in the form of Bobby Byrd of West Virginia and Ernest Hollings of South Carolina. Not known for their liberalism, by the way. Not known for them. And in the House, who were the brave? 21 of them. 21, with 28 voting present. Not daring to say no, but not, couldn't quite stomach saying yes. That's it. You know, so often when you look at votes, you know, big, meaningful, important, vital votes in the Congress, you know, our side, so to speak, is, it is in the 20s, when you count it, when it comes down to trashing the Constitution or whatever it happens to be, whatever the day's business is, disposing of the first, fourth, sixth amendments, for example, you can count on maybe 28 people standing up and saying that's a bad idea, and sometimes a few conservatives like Bob Barr, who's good on some of those Bill of Rights issues and terrible on a lot of other things. Is that an argument for the Greens or what? <laughs> By the way, I was asked, and I very gladly say it, um, on this issue of justice for Palestine and Palestinian issues, there is a rally to end the occupation uh, scheduled here on June the 8th, two days after my birthday. That might help you remember the whole thing. Uh, uh, where's it going to be? Westlake Park, 4th and Pine, 1 p.m., June the 8th. Make a note. What should happen, by the way? There should be a, the demonstration of even-handedness. They should say to Israel, no more settlements, not one. Even you look at, when you read the the Hebrew language press or an English translation, it's like night and day compared with what you can't read in the US press. There you'll read in papers like Haaretz, which now has an English language edition. You know the head of, uh, the head, former head of uh, the 
Israel's security agency, saying they should totally withdraw. This will never enhance the security of Israel long term. They should withdraw from the West Bank. Get out of it. Instead of which, across the spectrum of conventional American politics, you cannot see a glimmer of light, a glimmer of decency, a glimmer of a sense of justice for Palestinians. So, since September 11, has that, as a uh, provoker of terror, been diminished? No, I mean multiplied a thousand times. Multiplied a thousand times. What else? How about basically the sense of injustice in the world? You know, six billion people on the planet, I think about three billion of them live on about 50 cents a day. It's getting worse. Year after year, it gets worse. Some of you may remember, I'm sure many of you may remember, you know, back in the 70s, there were big hopes for some rectification of the balance of how resources and wealth are divided in the world. Some sense that third world countries might get a decent price for their commodities, like Jamaica selling its bauxite. All of that has been now swept away. There have been magnificent campaigns against this hideous global exploitation. But the fact of the matter is that things are worse infinitely than they were 25 years ago. What should happen? Obviously, there should be a, a martial program for the third world, with billions going into the third world instead of being sucked out of it. It's not hard to do. <laughs> not hard to do at all. We, we have seen, after all, across the last 10 years, the absolute catastrophic failure of so-called market-oriented reforms. How many times have we all read how many times have we all read in the paper, market-oriented reforms? I used to look at, you know, I, they must be, their fingers of these journalists, they're, they're so sort of webbed like that, so they can hit market-oriented reforms. Or it's like programmed into the computer. He made a joke, he, uh, unfair and low, of course, that's Morton for you, about, you know, my old technology. And it, there's something, you know, I, of course I've converted, I've come to modern times, I carry around my little iBook and all the rest of it. In the old days, I grew up, my dad was in the newspaper business, and you'd go to a newspaper building, and you know, you had a sense of production, mostly production of lies, of course, but you'd see, <laughs> it was hot metal. The building had a sense of, you know, something really was being produced. You'd see printers, and uh, printers' devils, and uh, big old lino machines, uh, the smell of ink in the air, you know, some sense of vitality. A real sense of life. Our old journalists were much more fun. You go into a modern newspaper office, it's like going into an insurance office. It's horrifying. Morton reminded me, I once wrote a line that you can't really hear people type anymore. It's like that little rustling, like rats' paws on the. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And journalists in the old days, they were bohemian, you know? I mean, I, my first job was writing, writing uh, so-called funny editorials for the Irish Times, th 31 shillings, which is like three, three bucks, I think, four bucks. Really bad for my pro style, really, really bad. T took me about three decades even to begin to recover. You know, it was meant to be facetious and uh, induced a quiet chuckle in the reader. Um, but, you know, journalists in those days, you know, they came from various walks of life. They actually knew something. They'd actually done something. You know, they'd, not, they'd been merchant seamen, or they, you know, they'd been around, or they'd tried, they'd tried uh, many different things. They actually knew how some things actually worked. They were mostly ill-paid, and many of them drunk. <laughs> I think English journalists, they really are drunk. I think I'd be shame at what they have to do on a daily basis. But, uh, but here, you know, the, the stakes now for journalists, in, I'm not talking about out here, so, but in Washington. You know, the, Ben Bradley, you know, the hero of the Watergate and the Carl Bernstein, uh, Woodward era, 
He said it one time. He actually said this. He said, you know, the stakes for journalists now are so much, you know, they're high. They don't want to, they don't want to take any risks. Why? Because they're earning tons of money. You know, a couple in Washington could be earning maybe three or four hundred thousand dollars a year together. They're not going to take any risks. They're too busy reading their stockbrokers' reports. They don't know anything. It's an entirely self-referential universe. You know, in the morning, watch the morning show, go through the day, reading the papers. In the evening, you watch the talk shows and go back. It's like an endlessly recycled dribble. That's them. So you'll never learn anything from that. And then they go out and they're presuming to comment and judge about how the planet is being destroyed. Market-oriented reforms. And you say, but haven't you looked out the window in the direction of Latin America and you see, however, what is it, 31 kleptocracies with the place looted from the bottom end of Chile to the top end of Venezuela and up. Looted. What happens under a rescue program in a market-oriented reform? You send in the World Bank, you send in the IMF, you send in, you say, a public health system? You've got to be kidding. Sell it. Transportation? Public? Sell it. The telephone company? Ooh, sell that. I'll buy that myself. <laughs> and the place is ripped to shreds. Put in a few local representatives. Anytime there's any resistance, try and pull the money out as rapidly as you can. The one of the other, but more optimism, they can't even mount a proper coup in Venezuela. <laughs> I don't think we should be nostalgic for the good old days when they could do it, by God. You know? <laughs> coup de farce, coup de farce, that's what I call it. But there were, to go back to the point, the planet is being looted, impoverished, everywhere you look. The solution is there, the possibility is there. And of course, the spirit of the Greens across the world is totally in defiance of that exploitation, whether it's expressed in against the uh, globalization in terms of getting better wages for people making Nike shoes or whatever it is. I'm not saying they're all greens in this party sense, but that's the spirit of the greens. That is a green spirit. What else? The way America fights its wars. How about that for a prompt of terror? Your wars now is what I said, the destruction of a country by remote Planes flying miles up in the air. What about Afghanistan? Surely that was a great triumph, right? Well, how much was really won? Did the Taliban beaten by force of arms, or did they just say, we'll, we'll, be all, we'll take off our uniforms for a bit. We'll change sides. We'll go to Pakistan. We'll go to Iran. We'll sit it out. What really happened? What's the, one of the, what's the main consequence? Some of you may remember the uh, Super Bowl ads. To do drugs is to help terror. Paid for at staggering expense. What was happening in Afghanistan? Well, you may remember, and by the way, I could plug an incredibly good book about this called White Heart by myself. <laughs> and uh, Jeffrey Sinclair, co-editor of Counterpunch, which actually has a, does have a good chapter on this song. Well, it has many good chapters, actually. But, uh, in fact, uh, an almost miraculous book. But, um, <laughs> they, as always, the CIA, whenever it's going in, it says to the drug smugglers and the growers, you know, we'll help you. Work with us. We'll help you. So, we're back in the Vietnam war era, they made the Golden Triangle and the Shan States into the premier producers of opium and shipped it up. Helped them ship it up on Air America. Countenance the putting of the, uh, the drug smuggling back to the States in the bodies of dead US soldiers. That's the agency for you. Balancing the good against the bad. When the U.S. decided to enlist the Mujahideen in the war 
against the Soviets and imported Osama bin Laden to Afghanistan in that great cause, they said to the, uh, the barons of Afghanistan, the land barons, sure, go ahead, opium, go for it. In fact, uh, an official in the Carter administration said this will lead to Afghanistan replacing the Shan states in Burma as the leading exporter of uh, morphine and heroin to the US and Europe. Absolutely, it came true. Now, let's come to the present, just so we can see the consequences of the war and all its ironies. Mullah Omar actually uh, banned the planting of opium poppies. I don't know what his motives were. Maybe he was some desperate attempt to ingratiate himself with the, with the, with the Bush administration, or maybe he wanted to restrict supply and hike the price. Who knows? But after he, uh, the Taliban, ran away, the new government said, no, nope, no more, we'll continue the ban. My brother Patrick told me he was standing in the office of opium control in Kabul when this announcement was made. Simultaneously, they, the people came in, took the, the man in charge of the war against drugs by the scruff of the neck, and kicked him into the street and converted the office into a radio station and approximately one million Afghan peasants went out and planted poppies. And now, Afghan is, Afghanistan is just about to produce its largest crop. That's the consequence. And when people said to the Bush administration, isn't an irony here? An irony that while you're putting up paying for ads, saying to do drugs is to help terror, they said, well, the war on terror is more important than the war on drugs. Now, the war on terror in any substantive, deeper meaning of stopping terror, as opposed to maybe stopping someone going through, uh, getting onto a plane armed, is clearly a total failure. Total failure. The US, I think, has more people, more soldiers, more military missions, around the world than ever before. I think the figure is like 126 countries. This is a global reach of military coercion, unexampled in the history of the planet. That's their wars. And of course, if you want to put it in bellicose language, we have our wars. We have our struggles to wage. Their, their world is a world dominated by the military. The budget, ever remember the peace dividend, by the way, at the end of the Cold War? Remember that brief shining moment when people said maybe $300 billion won't be used for military production, will be used for constructive uses to make people happier and better? What happened to happen to that? The system, their system runs on military spending. That's the blood that makes it pulse forward. Military spending ultimately needs war. Their system is an economy of war. What's our system? Our system, the Green Party philosophy in many ways, is the peaceful use of resources. War on greed, war on the military, war on the rape of the environment. And when people say, you know, what, what is the Green Party really up to? Well, there are a there are hundred different fronts. I was at a little gathering for the Greens around the corner here, Africanda, this fine restaurant just down the road here. You know, and there were people involved in environmental justice, there were people involved in uh, against the genome project, there were people involved in uh, uh, about five or six different campaigns. That is it, because so much in our political culture needs waking up. That's the function really of the Greens, to wake people up, to challenge. There are good people in the Democratic Party, excellent people, but they are within a closed system of inertia, really, ultimately. And that's always the answer to people say, boy, you rock the boat. You let the swine in by your irresponsible support of Ralph Nader or whoever it may be. And you have to say, do you want 
Do you want the cloud of indifference, of business as usual, of the money power to settle lower and lower and lower? Like fog on the highway? Or do you want some kind of cleansing force to be built up? That's what support of the Greens is all about. And I think really when one looks Oh, there's a phrase I ran across the other day. I was reading, um, I was going to say I was reading a book as though it was a rare event. It actually is a rare event. Like every now and again I try. But that civilization, the best of civilization is creative liberty. Creative liberty. I think it's very important when you're looking at a movement or a, a, a party, what is the animating idea? You know, sometimes you, know, you look at environmental groups and you know, it's all you know, little rules and little regs and you feel, where's the spirit here? I was, there's a wonderful example of the, you know, the spirit, there's a nudgy spirit sometimes, you know, where people have to be saved from themselves by more and more rules in case they do stupid things. I had a fantastic example the other day, the, the common market some bureaucrat decided that one of the great risks confronting humanity is when you change the wires on your amplifier and you lean over and you're trying to get the speaker wire on. If you firmly gripped both posts from each speaker, took the wire from the speaker off, turned the volume up to max, you would experience a slight tingling in your fingers. <laughs> Maybe that's what Jim Morrison tried to do at some point. I don't know. With the result that amplifiers made in Europe now have huge rubber grommets to prevent the, the ill-advised dropping of the hands over both posts of the amplifier and leading to momentary personal discomfiture. <laughs> we are, we're not in favor of that. We're not. We're for creative liberty. We say, if you're so dumb as to take the wires off your speaker and grip both and get a tingling which makes you feel bad, that's your fault. We don't care. The nanny spirit can go too far. There's another one. I'll give you another one, actually, which is the propane bottle crisis. Anyone familiar with the pro propane bottle crisis? I can see a hand go up. Two hands. Three. Oh, three hands. And when the price of propane went up a while back, you know, more and more places sell propane. And they were inexperienced administers of propane into the five gallon bottle. With the result, when you filled it up, people would fill it up until they saw a little cloud come up the top. Well, then the, the scenario is that people take their overfilled propane bottle back and stick it outside the trailer or whatever it is, and it, the sun shines down, it expands the propane. It won't blow up, but there'll be a little cloud of propane maybe coming out. Then if you light a cigarette, could be unfortunate. <laughs> so far as I know, this has never happened. More likely to be bitten to death by pigs <laughs> than have a propane thing. But somewhere out there, a very smart manufacturer of propane valves bought a congressperson and put a new reg in. That now when you put the new valves Screw a new valve in, there's a little float. When you fill up the tank, it'll stop before it gets up. Actually, you can get around that by tilting the tank slightly. You know, human ingenuity will always find a way. And also, they're worried about the fact that when you put the connector on the propane bottle, you know, people might thread it wrong. And so they've made a new glove-type threading th a device so that you can thread it on really well. Well, in California, obviously not really in the state of Washington, where you're all so smart or you don't use propane or whatever it is. The plan was that people would give back their old propane bottles and uh, they'd get new propane bottles. And that the, the propane companies were going to take the old valves out, employing probably Mexican labor, ill-paid, and put new things. Cost about 28 bucks. Walmart sent in opportunity. By the way, Walmart, you know it is now the number one company in the entire planet? Number one. You know, when people talk about corporate scandals in America, they're talking about Enron. Quite right, too. Good subject to talk about. 
But I was thinking, you know, every five years we have an Enron. It's endemic to the system, like military waste and fraud. It's inbuilt. I mean, they suddenly said, the accounting was wrong. The accounting is always wrong. <laughs> the fix is always in. But, how many of you remember? It goes by a panel collapse of the Penn Central, equity funding, the SNLs. It's like a long row of tombstones down the years. You can see it. But there's Walmart. No one says, you know, Walmart fixes its books. The analysts praise it. Now they want, they want to start, by the way, the bank of Walmart. Walmart from cradle to grave. Why is Walmart number one? We basically pay slave wages, seven or eight bucks an hour. That's it. That's what. That's the symbol of America's corporate pride. Seven bucks an hour. That's the one. There's now the beginnings of a, well, it started a campaign to organize Walmart. One of the most important battles in the United States. It will take a generation. If you want to look at what's going on in labor, I guess a magnificent target by the food workers. Anyway, just to finish up my little parable about nudginess, Walmart sells the propane bottles now for $23.95. No one wants the old propane bottles. The recycling companies come for it, because if you throw a propane bottle in the crusher, you don't know how much propane is in it. It'll blow up. So now you're asking the poor people in Butte County, where I was seeing this in action, to pay $6 to give back their propane bottle and then buy a new propane bottle. So what do they do? They throw it into the creek. And those people who've got recreational boats, when they can't do it, they'll throw it into Lake Tahoe. So next summer, I can promise you excitement. <laughs> Lake Tahoe will be bobbing with 10,000 depth charges. Someone should ring up uh, Ridge. <laughs> you don't know how much propane's in those bottles as it bobs up and down. And then the guy comes with his 50 mile an hour boat and he hits the propane bottle. That's it. So there's a little parable about nudginess. It's also a funny story. <laughs> Which brings us back to creative liberty. The vision has always got to be freedom at the bottom of the line. You know, the conservatives for a while stole the word back in the Reagan era. Well, we stand for freedom said Ray. They don't. They stand for oppression, misery. But if you're going to allure you know, new people to the cause, we stand for freedom, which means that we oppose all the endless restrictions and erosions of freedom that we see in society today. Two million people in prison. Two million. You all know that figure, but two million people, men and for non-violent offenses serving 15, 20 years. What has that war on drugs done? It's gone a fair way to destroying the Constitution, destroying the Bill of Rights, driving, driving a hole through the Fourth Amendment on searches and seizures, Sixth Amendment. Maybe the balance is beginning to swing the other way a little bit. What a way to go. One of the most tragic and horrible wars in history. Both its consequences abroad, where the war on drugs has been used as a pretext to attack insurgencies and struggles for social justice in the third world, and at home, where it's used as a club against poor people. You know, there's an amazing exchange between Nixon and Haldeman where they actually discuss how to really target people of color without saying so. And in the end, who really comes up with the way to do it? An alliance of Reagan and the Democrats, Tip O'Neill, with the drug laws of the 80s, after Len Bias had died of crack. When it was Tip O'Neill who framed the Democratic House Majority Leader, who framed that disproportion on crack and powder cocaine. A hundred times more savage for those who had crack, who of course are poor people.
The other thing, along with the fundamental target of creative liberty, is allies. I sometimes think that our crowd is a little closed off as to who you can work with. For example, the libertarians. Now, the libertarians are not great on everything. Like I often say to them, I'd be with you on something. Your views on child slavery, I don't totally approve of. <laughs> what do you mean? They say, well, you know, you're in favor of no laws and restraints on exploitation, you know, in the interest of the free market. So you want to put a, put a little anklet around a kid of nine and make him pull a coal trolley down a mine? Well, I don't, know, I don't really mean that. But, but libertarians are good on some things. They don't like wars. Some of the best stuff on intervention on the war on terror, if you go to antiwar.com, which is a libertarian site, you'll read great stuff. Out there in what is normally, I've, so many times I've gone to a city and people say, boy, we're, it's really conservative here. Someone said it actually about Spokane, it's a very conservative country. I, I, I've been to a hundred towns where people always say that. And then you start inquiring what's going on, and there's always something going on. Always something going on. There's always a church group, a labor group, a community group. And there's also a whole bunch of people who might be called conservative who are pissed off, just like we are. Totally pissed off. They know the system is loaded against them. They know that food, food support programs go to just the rich the rich farm corporations, if, they, if they're farmers in the country. They know the fix is in. It's a matter of figuring out the language and the issues in which you can share with them. That's not an impossible thing to do. And sometimes, so to speak, our side forgets that. Not you, of course. But. <laughs> So here we are, I think, at a beginning of an exciting period in our politics. We're seeing the increasing discomfiture of the chief executive. I think we're seeing even the Democrats timidly poking their noses up, <laughs> sniffing the air. Is it safe to come up? And we are seeing people like here thinking we're going into the next cycle, we're heading towards the next presidential election. Is it going to be the same again? Are we going to see Al Gore? I have a personal motive for wanting to see Al Gore, since there are 7,000 copies of a very good book <laughs> called Al Gore, a user's manual, lightly guarded. No one seems to want to steal them in the... Uh, <laughs> in a book depository in Chicago. <coughs> I think we probably will see him, by the way. And you'll be asked to rally to his side. Every awful thing Bush has done, Al would have done just exactly the same. Just exactly the same. <laughs> so I think, as always, you know, there are very exciting times ahead. Tremendous opportunities for organizing. Tremendous opportunities to frame programs and ideas. And Looking at the vitality, I've even met, you know, with the green people here in a few short hours. I think Seattle is in very good shape, and I think we're going to have a great time in the months and years ahead. Thank right. you. The question really was, uh, are they fixing to try and censor and control the internet, because the question is said, you know, which of course is true. And it's encouraging in many ways. And when you can't read about it in the papers, you can read about it on the internet, you know? I mean, I, I, I revere the critics of the media like Chomsky and the others, but I sometimes feel that they don't give enough time for the fact that there are, now we have sources of information we didn't have. Lots of sources of information we didn't have 10, 20 years ago. 
I can remember, you know, back in 82, just to take, I thought I mentioned Sharon, the invasion of Lebanon. It was hard to find good stuff. You had to get people to fax it from abroad, a nightmare. You ever tried to fax newsprint? It's always a horrible thing to have to do. Now you can go to any one of, uh, you know, 20 sites, or if you're interested in Colombia, if you're interested in whatever your issue might be, East Timor, there it is, you can get something. So the question really was, they, meaning the would-be censors, the government, the, the people who don't want you to have information unless it's put out by Time Life or Rupert Murdoch or MSNBC or whatever it is, are they going to try and erode the freedom of the internet? Of course they would dream of it on a daily, minute-by-minute -minute basis. Of course. They, all what we have, we have to fight for. You know, and always round the corner of the door comes the censor. And it can start, you know, with, you know, maybe, oh, it's not just kiddie porn. We're just trying to get rid of kiddie porn. There's always a pretext. But the next stage is, oh, we're just trying to stop obs obscenity. So we have to put this little bug in the program. Or we're trying to stop Al-Qaeda, so we're letting carnival loose. And there is still a great constituency for free speech in this country, a huge constituency for it. And so the answer is yes, they are trying, they're always trying, always, always, always trying. And the way it can be beaten off is by popular resistance. That's the only way they will ultimately be beaten off. I, I, I didn't think, I personally, did people hear the question? I, no, I, I think they're not, not for one minute did they contemplate it. And I think, you know, uh, the documents are all there. When you go back, you can go back and, you know, a lot of really good work has been done. You know, the, the strategy obviously was always to try to get it out of the UN, get away from Resolution 242, to get away from any sense that the UN might be the supervising body, trying to administer the situation, get it out of that. And Oslo was, of course, a, a mark of that. And I think the idea was one bit of the plan would be, you know, the little banter stands, you know, on the West Bank. And the other plan, which I think is being like kind of run up the flag, and I think the army thing was part of it, which is the idea of expulsion. And I think what we're seeing now, you know, very often when you get a big plan like that, there are trial balloons just to get people used to talking about the idea, even if they say it's a terrible idea. So you get Dick Army. Can you imagine if Dick Army had said it about any other group in the world, practically? They should leave, be booted up. Two million people, if he'd said it about, I don't know, any other group. There would have been a tremendous furor, I like to think. Maybe I'm wrong. As it was, what are the Ari Fleischer? Hey, liar at the White House. He said he never said it. He actually said he never said it. He did say it. The same Harry Fleischer, the same one who says that uh, Bush didn't come back to the White House on September 11 because there was an Al Qaeda mole uh, in the White House uh, sending out signals so that they would bomb the White House. I mean, a total lie. So I think no. I think the plan has always been, if under the pressure of international opinion to appear to give concessions, but long run, absolutely not. Could you comment on Lynn Stewart's case and its ramifications? Wait a minute, what is Lynn Stewart's case? Lynn Stewart's civil rights attorney. Oh, 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 yeah, sure. Um, if anyone else is saying what, <laughs> the, the civil rights attorney who was the attorney for, for, for uh, in, in New York, who was, uh, acting for Muslims and um, was then charged as being complicit. The Justice Department has, in various times, been increasingly keen to go after attorneys. Not just in the area of the so-called war on terror, but there was a long period when they were going after lawyers working for, on, in, on drug issues. In, in, uh, in the state of California, they went after a very prominent attorney in San Francisco, Patrick Hallinan. And it was obviously saying to attorneys, you know, you defend uh, people accused of uh, smuggling drugs, you could end up in the dark. And, you know, and of course, when the feds the, the, and the state try to throw the book at you, it's a pretty terrifying prospect. And the, the concept of the chilling effect is very definitely there. So I think that is 
you know, very much on the agenda what they're doing. Well, the question is said <clears throat> that when he raises the fact that uh, maybe the war on terror as fought and prosecuted by the Bush administration uh, uh, is not being well done, people say, well, you, you can't appease terror. What about Chamberlain? I mean, the U.S. appeases terror every day of the week when it's their terrorists. Sends them money, sends them off. That's terror. I don't think terror should. I think I don't think terror should be appeased. I think terror, the infliction of violence and death on innocent people, is not to be condoned for a minute. But how do you? The point I was uh, was driving at is that what they've done is not diminished in anything, but maybe a momentary, narrow sense. The, the fury and uh, homicidal rage that produces, or suicidal homicidal rage that produces terror. If you, know, if you were in the end, don't do anything to rectify economic injustice, to rectify the things I mentioned, then you've augmented terror. And uh, uh, that's the fact of the matter. Yeah, well, the, the, the question I was alluding to today's headlines, that, that, what, what I, one what vague new Al Qaeda threat? How amazing they discovered a threat <laughs> yesterday! Anything to counteract the headlines about FBI briefings in August and July? <laughs> of course, not the show and tell which we've been calling for. But uh, and then also, what happened to anthrax? Anthrax? What anthrax? Someone was saying earlier today, just before the thing, you know, there are any, you can actually figure out there are only about twenty people in the U.S. apparently with the possible scientific qualifications to do that kind of stuff. Why is suddenly the funereal silence inactivity on, on, on behalf of the FBI?